Mobutu was overthrown. And then when the journalists would come to town, <coughs> they'd be like, show me an opposition leader. And then the fixers would go, oh, there's Olenga Koi. And that's how anybody got to know Olenga Koi. Funus. Oh. Of course. Of course it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. No, we want, we, this is good. We want broad, people to come here for broad overviews. He's a bit worried because he's got big farms all over. Good morning. Welcome to this week's view on Africa on the state of political stability in the DRC. My name is Stephanie Walters. I'm the head of the Peace and Security Research Program at the Institute for Security Studies, and I'm also the DRC researcher. Um, it's been uh, about three months, I think, since we last had a view on Africa uh, on the DRC. Um, and today we're going to be focusing on um, essentially the conversation around elections. Um, in, in my presentation, I'll be looking at the status of implementation of the December 31st Accord, um, the uh, progress that has been made so far with election preparations, and then the status of the opposition, how is the opposition responding to the current political context, um, and then finally looking also at the international response to the instability in, in the DRC. Um, obviously, during the question and answer period, you're welcome to focus on uh, issues that you are, uh, are interested in, but that is going to be the broad overview in the initial 15-minute presentation that I'm going to give. So just a quick reminder, um, what is the December 31st Accord? The December 31st uh, Accord um, was reached on December 31st. It was brokered by the Catholic Church. The reason it was necessary was because Kabila's mandate expired according to the Constitution on December 19th, 2016. And there was a need to, I'm just welcoming some of our visitors in, in, in here in Pretoria, welcome. Um, there was a need to um, find some kind of transition arrangement that would govern this, uh, pro th govern the country essentially once uh, Kabila's mandate had expired. As I've said in the past, the December 31st Accord was on paper a very good one. It spoke about having elections this year. It put in place a number of different structures um, that were um, populated and led by the various different signatories and accounted for balance between the Congolese government and the opposition. Um, it also had explicit language about Kabila not being able to stay on for another mandate and about not being able to change the constitution in the transition period. It was on paper a, a very good document. Um, it, of course, because of the crisis and because of the fact that there has long been, been suspicion that the reason for the election delay is not in fact technical but much more political and that Kabila wants to stay on uh, longer, um, there was always some uh, doubt about whether or not this accord would be implemented fully. Um, and that, in fact, has now uh, become the, the reality, which is that um, as, a, as a result, essentially, of political manipulations, but also some uh, uncontrollable elements, notably the death of Etienne Chisikedi, today we find that the December 31st Accord is, for all intents and purposes, uh, dead in the water. It is no longer a document um, that is governing the current political arrangements in the DRC, and that is as a result of uh, a lack of political will um, on, on the part of the government um, and then some 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 external uh, um, developments. So where are we today? Um, we um, have a government that was formed in in April. Uh, uh, the prime minister was appointed in April uh, unilaterally, essentially by the Congolese government. Uh, the accord had called for the prime minister mm -hmm. to come from the Rassemblement, the main opposition grouping, um, and that would have been essentially uh, a post that would have been nominated uh, by the head of the Rassop, the UDPS, Etienne Chisikidi, who unfortunately passed away on February 2nd. Instead, in the aftermath with the political muddle and the opportunism in the, in the opposition, the 
Congolese government took advantage of that and nominated Bruno Chibala, who is a dissident opposition leader from a rival branch of the RASOP, which for all intents and purposes exists on paper, but not in, in, in any kind of, with any kind of real political base. So Bruno Chibala is now the prime minister heading a government also that is not inclusive, that is largely made up of the um, ruling uh, majorité présidentielle and some co-opted opposition members. Um, it, this government and this uh, prime minister have not really succeeded in gaining any credibility either domestically or internationally. Um, most uh, observers, domestic and international, consider that the nomination of Chibala was a violation of the accord and does not respect the spirit of inclusivity and consensus. Um, some of the next steps that have been taken is that um, in spite of the fact that the key signatories to the December Accord uh, did not agree with the way it was being implemented, um, it was nonetheless, the, the details of it, there was another subsequent signing that nonetheless proceeded. Uh, this too was considered to be uh, a violation of the spirit and the letter of the Accord and a unilateral move driven essentially by the, the Kabila government. The final element of the structures that were called for by the December 31st Accord is appointing a head to the Conseil National de Suivi à l'Accord, so the follow-up committee for the implementation of the Accord, which is an important body uh, because it is one of the, with the government and the Independent Electoral Commission, one of the three bodies that is mandated by the Accord specifically to, uh, to organize the presidential elections. So it's the third um, element in, 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 in the checks and balances that the December 31st Accord had essentially created. Um, again, the December 31st Accord is very clear. The head of the CNSA is the person who heads, um, who, who heads the, the leadership of the Rassemblement. Um, this was, um, of course, also um, um, affected, who leads the Rassemblement was affected by the death of Etienne Chesikedi. The Rassemblement did then nominate Pierre Lumbi to um, had, have that position, um, but because of the splits in the Rassemblement, um, they were rivals. They were essentially pro-government opposition leaders who were then co-opted, and in fact, this weekend, the government nominated one of those people, Joseph Olinga Koy, uh, a dissident member of the RASOP, to lead the CNSA. Again, the, the nomination of Olinga Koy is much like the nomination of the prime minister in that it is a person who is not, uh, who was not nominated by the primary original Rassemblement. Um, most of the opposition parties in the DRC, those who have signed the December Accord and those who have not, have criticized this nomination. Um, and again, it is unlikely to lead to any kind of real credibility. What does that mean? That means that the institutions and the processes that were decided on the December 31st Accord have now all been co-opted and staged managed by the Congolese government. The spirit of consensus that that accord was meant to enshrine and meant to follow has been violated. And so this is no longer really the roadmap that it was meant to be, um, which is problematic, of course. I'll come back to why that's problematic when I discuss uh, what the opposition's response at the moment is. Now, obviously, the real issue here, and this is important to remind ourselves of this, because in the last few weeks and months, there has been a lot of talk about positions, about government positions, about positions leading the Conseil National de Suivi, about who becomes prime minister. And one can get the impression, uh, or one can lose sight of the fact that this is all about organizing elections. The reason that we're having these transition arrangements is because elections were meant to held, be held by the end of 2016. They were not held. The primary political priority in the DRC today is holding those elections. It gives the government credibility and it allows the country to move on from a political crisis and a political process which has essentially monopolized uh, the space in the DRC for, for, for about two, two years, two, three years. Now. Um, the CENI had told us last year, the Independent Electoral Commission had told us last year that it would take until July 31st this year to complete the voter registration process. New voters have to be added to the voters' roll, and after the 2011 elections uh, which were contested, the international donor community also demanded that this voters' roll be, uh, this voter registration be reviewed. Now that process has been ongoing uh, for about 18 months. It did run into some delays in getting started, um, but it has made 
fairly substantial progress over the course of the second half of last year and the first half of this year. Much of the process has been completed in the country's 26 provinces. Uh, registration started in Kinshasa as well um, in late May um, and has more or less been, been completed. The key issue uh, is that voter registration has been suspended in the Kasai region. The Kasai region is the region that is affected by the violence um, between the Congolese army and the Kamwina in, in Sapu militia and the associated militias that have sprung up in, in, in the context of that violence. And the Congolese government suspended uh, registration there as a result of high levels of insecurity. The sum total of the population that, uh, the, that makes up the electorate in that region is about 7.6%. It's a key part of the country. Uh, there, is, there is general sort of acceptance that the elections cannot proceed unless voter registration has taken place there. Um, and so it's very important that stability be restored uh, for a variety of reasons, but also because it's important that the voter registration process resume there. Now, um, just a quick aside, there have been, uh, no one is disputing that there is violence in that region. There have been allegations that this is precisely what the Congolese government would have wanted uh, as an excuse to, to suspend, elect, suspend the registration there and therefore delay the elections further. Now, this is just something to mention because there is a lot of contestation around, um, around this, this suspension of the voter registration process. The, um, the Francophonie, the international organization of the Francophonie, is one of the um, key international organizations that has been accompanying the election process uh, so far, the electoral preparation process, I should say. Um, they have been invited on numerous occasions by the Congolese government to assist with technical recommendations, and they conducted an initial evaluation of, um, of the process in the DRC uh, in the first half of 2017 and then pr uh, produced a report which was um, made public in May. Um, some of the key findings of that, and this, this is an important process because with so much politicization of the electoral process, it's important that there be technical partners who can speak about what's actually happening with electoral pr preparations. So some of, the, some of the key findings of this, this, um, this report, um, I won't go too much into the technical details about the registration process. You can all access this report online. Um, but some of the key observations is that um, there have been a very low number of observers of the registration process, whether that be civil society or political parties, all of whom have a right to have observers present during the registration process to ensure credibility. Um, there are a variety of reasons why this may be the case. Uh, resources tend to be the, the primary reason that keep uh, observers from being mobilized. Um, also, of course, the size of the country. But So there have been very few uh, neutral observers involved in the registration process. It's an important thing to remember. But also some of the contextual issues. So while voter, the voter registration process has proceeded fairly straightforwardly and at a reasonable pace, um, according to the OIF, some of the context um, in order for elections to be held this year, some of the key sort of frameworks, le legislative frameworks, have not been put in place. So there's a law on electoral financing that has not been adopted by Parliament, and there's a law on circumscriptions, um, where they are and so on, and how they are delineated, which of course is, is linked to the process of completing the voter registration process and how many people live in what um, what area, um, both of those are still pending. Now, Parliament closed its last session in June, and it won't reopen again for several months. So that's another delay um, that is very much already, um, that is in, in, in fact uh, exists, and that could um, potentially um, delay the holding of elections this year. Um, the OIF, in spite of the fact that it's, it's focused essentially on technical preparations, has also noted the difficulties that the, the country is having politically, um, and especially with the implementation of the December 31st Accords. So it has spoken very clearly about the delay in nominating the head of the um, follow-up uh, committee, that is one of the three bodies that will lead, that will lead the electoral preparations, that is the CNSA. Uh, that's where um, uh, that nomination was made this past weekend. Um, and it has noted general uh, political blockages uh, that are standing in the way of, of, of the elections. Um, another issue, and this is another important one, is the financing of the Independent Electoral Commission, and not just the financing, but also the disbursement, the regular disbursement of funding to the Independent Electoral Commission. 
Now, there's no explicit language in this report about whether or not, if the stars align properly and all of these legislative issues are resolved and financing is resolved, whether or not elections can still be held by the end of 2017. This is not something that the OIF has said explicitly. But the sense is that this could, in fact, if everybody wanted to, if there was the political will to do this, one could see elections taking place this year. Um, one of the questions that they have asked um, is whether or not one needs to have the presidential and legislative and provincial elections all at the same time. This is something that the Independent Electoral Commission has says it wants to do. Uh, there is a view by international partners that really the, the biggest issue right now is the presidential election. And that politically, if you, if, to, in order to restore stability, this should be prioritized, both financially and in terms of logistics. Um, there is pushback from the government and from the Independent Electoral Commission on this. Now, we, that is the technical overview or the technical feedback that we have from a neutral, neutral partner. Um, again, I encourage all of you to look at the report online if you want to. It's not very long and it's very useful. Uh, just in also some of the, the numbers that are involved, something like, uh, just to give you a sense, when all the elections are held, potentially if the legislative, polit um, presidential and uh, provincial elections are held at once, we're looking at 64,000 candidates. So you can imagine what that ballot is going to look like, just to give you a sense of the scope of this. Of, and the scale of this. And, and I think that much as we are, are, are aware that the delays are politically manipulated, there is also the very real logistical challenge of holding elections in the DRC. Um, so that's the, that's the independent assessment of the technical preparations. In the meantime, we have seen Corneille Nanga, the head of the Independent Electoral Commission, speaking in Europe last week, or uh, two weeks ago now, I think, um, and saying very clearly that elections will not be held in 2017. Um, of course, that is the one thing that everybody now will remember. Uh, the technical uh, uh, feedback from the OIF is one thing, but when the head of the Independent Electoral Commission, who is seen to be someone who is politicized, says that there won't be elections this year, I think we can probably uh, uh, conclude that there won't be elections this year. Um, this is the first time that that statement has been made as explicitly as it was made. Um, and no real context was given as to why exactly. Obviously, the Kasai issue has been raised, um, and general instability. Uh, some budgetary issues were raised earlier this year by the finance minister as well. I think, again, I, I want to say that my opinion is that um, if the political will to hold these elections were there, they could be held by the end of this year. I think that is also the view of the technical experts. Um, where is the opposition now? Um, the December 31st accord is in tatters. The opposition led by Félix Tshisekedi, the Rassemblement de l'Opposition with the UDPS and the G7, which also includes Moïse Katumbi, um, and some of the other key players like Olivier Kamitatu and Pierre Lumbi, um, uh, are not part of a new government. They had signed the December 31st Accord, but they are not represented in the structures that were meant to come out of that. Um, where, is, where is the opposition? The opposition emerged from the, the, the aftermath of Chisikidi's death and the kind of, if you will, uh, bun fight over um, the appointments to government and prime minister looking a little bit tainted itself, looking a little bit like it was as much interested in or more interested in uh, accessing power than in leading the country to elections and resolving the political crisis. And it has certainly lost some of the uh, status um, that, it, that it had amongst the population. The other problem was that it didn't really have a plan B. Um, it wasn't really clear how it was going to rally after the December 31st accord was in tatters. How would it organize itself around what? What was it going to ask for next? Um, it seems that this lull uh, has, has now passed, has come to an end. Um, we've seen in the last week the Rassemblement hold um, one of its first uh, uh, big meetings since the death of Etienne Chisikedi as, as a full umbrella movement. It held a, a conclave in Kinshasa and has presented a new uh, plan. This plan is to hold stayaways on the 7th and the 8th of August um, in the next few weeks, um, followed by a more extended civil disobedience campaign. Now, it's a risky risky uh, a plan because um, asking people who are, are essentially involved in informal activities as most Congolese are to stay awake from work for two days in a row is a very tall order. 
Um, it's also risky because the last stay away wasn't um, that, that the Rassemblement called for wasn't observed um, in, to a great extent. And so it, it can weaken you. If people don't observe your stay away, it makes you look weak. And very uh, much of what these public demonstrations have been about is about demonstrating strength. And so I think that the opposition's calculation is that the population has now seen that the Congolese government is not serious about the December 31st Accords or about elections, and it clearly feels that it now has the capacity to organize and mobilize on the basis of that disillusionment again with the passing of time. Um, so that is where the opposition stands. There have been some um, changes in, in, in some of the um, opposition um, alignments, if you will. Vital Kameri, who had participated in the December 31st Accords and also um, and signed them and had then um, uh, um, aligned himself more closely with the government, has now decided to move away from the government again. He has um, not accepted the appointment to be the vice president of the um, follow-up committee um, on the grounds that the, the implementation of the Accords is being staged, managed by the government, is not following the letter or the spirit. So Vital Kamere back in the opposition camp um, more than he, he was before. I think the opposition, um, we, we are likely to see uh, a more uh, united front in the opposition in the, in, in the near future. And that is really because I think the understanding now is that, that there's no more doubt that Kabila and his, his, his entourage are w wanting to stay on as long as possible. And so there needs to be a new strategy how to engage, how to keep this alive, how to keep the pressure alive, how to potentially engage international actors, um, regional actors, um, in, in what is now looking like an extended battle, if you will, to try and get those elections to happen, and then also, of course, to have those elections be free and fair. So I think the opposition has realized that. It's gone from being uh, united um, last year and then through the signing of the accord to being disunited after the death of Chisikidi. I think to now enter a period of, of greater unity um, for the purposes of achieving these elections. So I think we'll see more, more, more action on that in the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, now, the international response is, is very important. Um, we, we've, the international community, the Western donors, the traditional Western donors, um, have been critical of the delays, increasingly critical of the government, increasingly vocal about what they see as a lack of willingness by the Congolese government and by Kabila himself to ha hold elections and to leave office. Um, they have been critical about the way in which uh, the government has implemented the accord. Um, and so there's very little ambiguity there. Sanctions have been imposed on the grounds largely of violations committed by security sector leaders, but increasingly also by politicians with links to the security sector and with links to the way in which the security sector is responding to public demonstrations, and also the Kasais. The Kasais, I've been saying since the beginning of the year, is really a game changer in many ways. Um, we are probably going to see another round of sanctions being imposed in October. Um, much as the Congolese government um, is responding and saying these don't matter to us, they do matter. They matter a lot and they are scaring people and they are dividing the entourage around Kabila. If you speak with people in Kinshasa, um, some, of the, some of the diplomats there, they are regularly seeing um, people from the entourage speaking to them, trying to plead with them about the sanctions and showing greater uncertainty, I would say, than they have before. So I think that there is a lot of movement there that we have to, 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 to keep in mind. And of course, that is one of the, one of the objectives of sanctions. Um, I mean, it is to try and create this kind of political uncertainty and, 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 and punish key people who may then choose to, to change their political path. That, that is one of the key elements of sanctions. Um, the African Union did uh, adopt a statement um, in which it criticized sanctions in general at its last uh, summit in, in July. Um, Joseph Kabila attended that summit, and I think it's a measure of how he is trying to uh, sort of uh, join himself to the lobbying campaign that has been largely led by his foreign minister in the past few months. That lobbying campaign is aimed at getting the uh, African community in particular, African regional bodies and also the African Union, to accept the way in which the government has implemented the December 31st Accords. So Leonard Chiokitundu, the foreign minister, has been doing the rounds of many of the uh, capitals and has been meeting with some of the key African leaders to try and get buy-in there. Um, I think that 
South Africa, or sorry, um, the DRC feels to some extent that it has been successful with that, but I'll come to some of its key allies where it has been less successful. The AU, um, like I said, has made this statement about sanctions. I think that um, Kabila was hoping for something more explicit, some more explicit language linked to sanctions on the DRC. He did not get that. But his attendance at that summit, I think, is very important. It's not just symbolic. He meant he was there for, to achieve something. I think he, he walked away with less than he had hoped for. SADC um, and the other regional body concerned with the DRC ICGLR have been rather quiet. Um, uh, they um, have had a mission, SADC had a mission up in the DRC in May, um, but has not, sorry, in April, but has not made any particularly um, clear statements since then necessarily about um, how things are going uh, politically and uh, the political crisis. We also don't know whether DRC, maybe someone in this room can help me, but I, I haven't heard whether DRC is going to be on the agenda of the next SADC summit. I'm not aware that, that it is. Um, now, a key bilateral ally, and uh, again, this is something I've said before, is Angola. Angola has been as vocal as Angola has ever been uh, about any kind of um, um, issue in the region and has, has criticized um, the DRC uh, vocally about um, the, the delays uh, and about some of the problems, the political problems involved with the, um, the implementation of the court. As you will all remember, it was Angola that nudged Kabila rather firmly back to the negotiating table after the October 18th accord that had been brokered by the African Union um, was judged by Angola not to be sufficiently uh, inclusive to really restore stability to the country. Um, and so Angola is real, has really been a, a behind the scenes, an important behind the scenes player uh, in the DRC. Um, and they are not happy. They are not happy with the ongoing instability. They're not happy with the fact that the accords were good on paper, but are not really being implemented in, 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 with a consensus. Um, they are also not very happy about developments in the Kasais. What they want in Kinshasa is an ally who can guarantee regional stability, stability along their border. Um, and I think that they are quite serious about their message uh, to Kabila that it is also time for him to clearly state that he's not going to stay on and that his mandate really has come to an end. So there, this is a very serious uh, development for the DRC. Um, how it will handle that is another question. Um, it has really responded to criticism coming from various different corners with, by becoming more defensive. I, I, I think um, we'll, we'll have to see how that works out for it with Angola. Um, now, South Africa, um, Kabila made a very high-profile visit to South Africa not long ago, um, where essentially <clears throat> he walked away with um, assurances from South African President Jacob Zuma that the alliance between the two of them remained in place. Uh, Zuma was not um, publicly, at least, um, critical of uh, the implementation of the accord and the way in which it had been implemented. Um, and so that is a, another key element to watch. South Africa clearly has a big role to play bilaterally with the DRC, but also regionally as a leader of SADC. Um, and so this is an, an extremely important um, ally and, and relationship in, in how this crisis is, is, is resolved. A final element, and I've gone over my time, a final element is that um, the South Africa voted against uh, an independent, uh, the, the constitution of an independent um, commission of inquiry into events in Kasai uh, at the Human, Human Rights Council in June, uh, which I think is a very telling um, vote. It, it's been highly criticized for that. Um, the, the evidence that the UN High Commission presented was, was, was I think, um, fair, very neutral, uh, and it was about human rights violations, not about politics. Uh, and nonetheless, um, that South Africa voted against the kind of a constitution of an independent inquiry. So that's another element in, in that relationship. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll end this, um, and then uh, hopefully take your questions. Thank you very much.